morning, everybody. Today we're going to be discussing suicide. And before we get into it, I just would like to hopefully take some of the stigma out of this word and make it analogous in your mind to a major coronary event, a heart attack, or the end of a battle with cancer. And this is the cancer of the mind, not the brain necessarily, but the mind, your thought mechanism. And I'm honored today to have on our guest, Kelly Posner, who directs our Columbia Protocol for Suicide Prevention. Welcome, Kelly. Hi, really happy to, to be here with you today. It's, a, it's an important time to be having this conversation. The timing is, is, is quite sad, and, and we have uh, you know, our mourning for our, our lost hero, Lorna Breen, and obviously that's on all of our minds, but suicide extends beyond just physicians, policemen, firemen, others at risk, first uh, responders. Um, in terms of what's happening now in the world uh, with the stress of COVID and people being isolated and the increased uh, burden on mental health, are there some things that we should do from our places at home in order to be more aware or be ready to address uh, the stress that's, that's on all of us during this, this very difficult time? First of all, let me start with the good news, okay? Suicide is preventable. We know what we can do to save lives, but it is, our baseline here is that it's one of the world's made most major public health crises. You know, it takes more firemen than fire, more police than crime, more lives than, than car accidents. We know that 50% of suicides see their primary care doctor the month before they die. We should be asking questions the way we monitor for blood pressure. But we know that we have to have that, men, that, that conception well beyond the doctor's office, because you know what? Many people don't ever get to the doctor's office. So, you know, the Undersecretary of Defense wrote this urgent memo about the Columbia Protocol that we have to go find people where they work, live, and thrive right? Because that's where they're at risk. We have to have a public health approach. So when people are asking questions, again, we have to find the people suffering in silence to connect them to the treatment they need. And before, nobody knew what questions to ask. They didn't know what to do with the answers. And they didn't know even if they should ask. So one of the great things is we actually know what to ask. And you know what, Thomas, you know what? People who are suffering actually want help. And they the stigma when it comes to the caretakers, right? Doctors who feel like they have a pressure, you know, medical caretakers to be strong, to be invulnerable. Police and firemen, the culture of machismo, you know, you know what's, you know what's strong? Seeking help is, that makes somebody really strong. And that's the stigma we really have to start to break down so people reach out for the help they need Sometimes people don't have the will to reach out for help. That's why we have to go to them more than ever. Remember when I said 50% of suicides see their primary care doctor? So we have to have that, we have to have that, that culture well beyond the doctor's office. So for example, in Major League Baseball, somebody checking on somebody's knee will maybe ask the questions. Construction workers, it's the number one cause of death. Hopefully in the safety checks in the morning, they won't just get the hard hat they'll get the Columbia, right? But when there are times of risk, we have to be even more vigilant about tracking and asking. And certainly this is, this is one of those times. You mentioned that people have a sense of, of, of um, not wanting to be vulnerable, especially healthcare workers. We, we wanna be invincible. And if there's something that sticks out in my mind from the world of psychology, it's, it's uh, Jung's shadow archetype. The, the idea that there's a hero within us, but there's also this shadow. And people might have this concept that, no, it's not gonna be me. I, 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 that's beyond what I'm capable of. But depression is insidious, like hypertension is insidious, and it slowly creeps up and it slowly takes hold. And so the same way we maintain blood pressure, we need to maintain the mental health. And we need to be aware that these vulnerabilities exist in all of us. So can you speak a little bit to that idea of the shadow archetype, the idea that we all have this balance of, of, of power and, and, and how can we feel heroic and, and try to do the best job we can while being vulnerable? We don't judge, we don't, we don't judge ourselves for having hypertension. We don't judge ourselves for needing glasses right? Depression 
is about serotonin imbalances. It's a brain chemical illness. So the more we understand that, right? And by the way, it touches more people than anything. Did you know that depression is the number one cause of global disability? So this biological chemical illness costs humanity more than anything. So when we just put our, our rational, right? When we just look at the facts, of course we shouldn't judge, judge ourselves as we wouldn't for any other medical illness. But the problem is there have been centuries of stigma and misunderstanding and silence. Nobody right? wants to be that, yeah, nobody wants to be Eeyore, right? If this is Winnie the Pooh, nobody wants to be that person complaining, right? Yep. So how do you find that balance of being, being vulnerable and being open uh, and, and allowing someone to help you when you're used to, especially for healthcare providers, being yep. the caretaker of others? Right, right. But we just have to keep understanding that to care for others, we have to care for ourselves. Yes. The, the strength comes from seeing that and and not giving into the stigma as a society listen we've we're making progress right a lot more of america and americans because it touches so many people you know actually really see this as as a medical illness and and by the way you know one of the things that i i wanted to say too is that for every suicide death you know 135 people are affected at least and those effects linger across generations because of that silence. And it, when we learn to just ask and be there and think about this in a different way, we build resilience, we break that silence, and we build it, you know, we build it for generations. It's why when um, Israel, um, most countries use this simple thing called the Columbia Protocol, which is the first time we identify who's at risk. And they said it not only saves millions of lives, it changes the way they live their lives by breaking down barriers that have been built up over thousands of years. And you know, Major League Baseball and the Parkland community, my, my friend who lost his daughter at Parkland, they also made the point that it also helps you. Do you know that increasing self-worth is one of the most important things we know from being helpful in mass traumas? Right, so community peer-to-peer -peer inter interventions, you know, help helps us all. So service to the community, uh, bringing bringing someone to to uh, to others, uh, meeting them where they are. I know there's a lot of fear in asking these questions. There's there's a perception that if we ask, maybe we're opening a door to something and and, and offering somebody an opportunity to do something harmful, but. That's been shown scientifically to not be the case, right? We can ask the question without planting a seed of, of doubt in somebody's mind and, and, and creating a suicidal situation. Is that right? Yes, that's absolutely right. There's a lot of clinical lore and misunderstanding that if you ask, it's going to cause somebody to be suicidal. Actually, there's a, you know, a seminal article in JAMA from one of the other authors on the Columbia Protocol that shows exactly the opposite. It not only doesn't cause you to be suicidal, it doesn't even cause distress. In fact, it reduces distress because when people are suffering, they actually want to be asked and they want help. And again, and before we didn't know what questions to ask, we didn't know what to do with the answers. We didn't know if it would be harmful. We also, as human beings and professionals, worried about liability because we don't have a perfect formula. How can I ask? What if something happens? Well, this is the good news. This simple thing has so much science behind it, unprecedented science, that 120 studies that even the Supreme Court brief wrote about it after MIT had a suicide, the college, that this is the minimum standard. So people are freed up to be able to ask, and God forbid something happens, you did the best you could. Yeah, that's, that's super important. The idea that we have a scientific program that you can methodically read down the questions. You don't have to create this again. There's no reinventing the wheel. It's available to you online, Columbia Protocol. But the idea is that uh, these questions will guide you, and, and you can be a hero in the sense that you can open the door of communication for someone else, for everyone at home feeling helpless and feeling like they're not sure what they can do to, to, to make a difference. Pick up the phone, call somebody you care about, reach out to a friend or a neighbor that you know is lonely and ask the questions. Is that right, Kelly? Meet them where they are? 
be beautifully said. And, and, and if, and if they're not, if they're not feeling suicidal, they'll still appreciate being asked and you'll be able to help the people that are. And by the way, just to set context, I mean, only 1% of people who get asked those questions typically have a high risk answer, right? So now it's, it might be a little bit higher, right? Given this time, but it's one of those things that will only be helpful and, and do no harm. And again, we have to connect people to the care they need and, and, and encourage them to use telehealth, which by the way, this is the good news. Do you know telepsychiatry is totally equivalent to your regular in-person visit in terms of efficacy and how people feel about it, et cetera. In so. terms of connecting with people, I read something interesting a friend of mine posted on social media about eye contact on social media platforms releases oxytocin in a similar way to eye contact in person, which is really uh, great news about connecting socially through these platforms. Wow, that's great. Yeah, that's very interesting. The other thing I wanted to tell you to kind of set the context of magnitude of what it means to connect you know, there's a study that showed the opposite. Loneliness is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, more lethal than heart disease and obesity. So if, lest you doubt the power of asking and checking in with your neighbor or loved one, just remember that. Loneliness is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That was before we were in this magnitude of, of, of loneliness and risk you know, that the pandemic has brought. I do, I do uh, find that there's one uh, positive that comes out of this uh, current uh, mitigation strategy. When I'm out for a walk with my family, neighbors are also out and it, it, there's waves and, and hellos and, and things that weren't happening as much before this epidemic, uh, pandemic, I'm sorry. And uh, we saw a kid uh, coming down the street the other day and, and he was just so excited to see people waving and saying hi. And, you know, you're engaging from maybe some distance, but it's still, it's nice to be able to see people. So I, I've been encouraging people to get outdoors and connect that way. I think it's, it's really important to have some version of, of connection to avoid that loneliness. Yeah, there's a solidarity also that's happening, you know, and, and, and in ways we've never seen before, which is the, the other thing that we were, was being discussed on this global call is that in some ways, the, the stigma that has been, you know, so entrenched with mental health is really, we're talking about it so much now and people are embracing these issues in a way that, that hasn't happened before. So that, that's also the good news. You know, and again, these things are treatable. Suicide is preventable, unlike the other, you know, you know, terrible things we're facing right now. So, you know, yeah, so remember that's, that. it. that's it. That's a very important point. Uh, the, the economic stress, the, the stress of being isolated, all of these things come with a great burden. And we know that stress releases cortisol and can increase anxiety, but it also increases oxytocin. And there is some attachment of stress to being completely negative. But when we associate meaning to, to stress, when we associate something of value, it encourages those pathways that reward the brain through oxytocin, dopamine, et cetera. So when we think about treatment, exercise is a treatment, meditation is a treatment. It's not just pharmacological treatment. Connecting with others is a treatment. Can you speak to uh, us a little bit about meaning and deriving meaning in the face of stress? Yes, I, it, it, I'm so glad you brought that up because it, it, it's actually one of the most important things you know, we, we know, we know that matters, you know, when, when people go from active duty to veteran status, you know, and they lose their sense of purpose. We know that has been one of the very, very significant risk factors to them being vulnerable to mental health issues, right? So we know from other mass traumas, okay, that, finding meaning, helping your fellow citizen, helping your fellow coworker, having community efforts to do just that is one of the most important 
mitigation factors, you know? And when SARS happened, they did, you know, lots of surveys, et cetera. And no, no surprise, you know, like 80%, 70 or 80% of people felt hopeless. hopeless. And when you're engaged in producing meaning and purpose and helping each other, that to absolutely mitigate, mitigates that, that sense of hopelessness and, and helplessness, right? So I'm so glad you, you brought that up. That's, yeah, that's a, a good way to kind of drive this point home. I think of people who are recovering from addiction, and, and I, I, I imagine in my mind that the ones I've seen that are successful, in, in a former life, I worked in a, uh, in a rehabilitation clinic for uh, drug use, and it really opened my eyes to, to, this, to this idea of, of addiction being like cancer and mental health issues trumping everything. If you don't have mental health, you, you don't have health. So we, we need to start there and prioritize. So the, the addicts who recovered, in my experience, have dedicated them to serving others and, and give back to other addicts. They, they, they are that big brother or big sister to others and, and, and offer their, their service. And, and they seem to have the highest level of success. So here's an opportunity for everyone out there to, to give back something to your community by asking these questions. Do you agree with that approach, that premise, that idea? Absolutely agree with it. Like, you know, having, having a sense of purpose and giving back will, I started in the beginning saying something like this, will not only help the person you're talking to and reaching out to, it will absolutely help you and, and, and us as well. And, and you brought up another thing that is something to really think about as well. You know, we know that you know, um, substance abuse and, and all the issues we're having with, with overdoses, you know, a bunch of those are suicides, okay? But even when they're not, they're often people desperately trying to self-medicate in lieu of proper treatment, right? And, and there's that, treatment. There is treatment available, right? It, just jump on that exactly. telehealth call and get treated and, and uh, maybe interfere with that process. Exactly. And it's, 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 as you said, it's not only medicine, it's, it's CBT, it's cognitive behavioral treatment, it's telehealth, it's all the other um, supplemental things that you can do to feel good, exercise, et cetera, as you were saying. There's tremendous grief in the world today. There, there's people dying. There's people afraid. Uh, those who are losing loved ones don't have an opportunity to go through the process of grieving in a way that we're used to. We're used to gathering and consoling one another, and, and it's just not possible right now. And we know from, from research on the stages of grief that it's really important to go through that process, and it's really important to have a social network. What would you say to people who are grieving right now? All the things we know about how to deal with it are kind of turned, turned upside down, right? It's like a collective grief that we're dealing with, we're dealing with as, as well. And sometimes, you know, grief leads to depression, and that's another, yet another risk factor, right, for suicide. But, but, but most people will just go through normal, normal grieving. And here, the issue is being creative in how you can memorialize your loved ones right now in ways that we obviously, in ways that are limited, right? You know, the same way people are having you know, having cocktails with each other, you know, people have memorial services, they go to, they go to temple virtually, you know, they go to religious services virtually. So, you know, we have to find ways. It's one of the other things that we know from mass trauma that other mass traumas that, that not only community efforts and, and helping other people, but memorializing them, right? And then do understand that you will be able to have those getting together, you know, opportunities to continue that memorialization. Um, but we just have to pay attention to what we know, you know, will be helpful and, you know, as helpful as, as you can be when you're going through, through losses like this. Uh, again, drawing meaning through memorializing uh, someone we love or care about is, is very important. Uh, Lorna Breen and her family really making the, the, the point that Lorna was a healthcare hero and she's a casualty of this disease. I could not possibly agree more. Uh, she died of an illness that affects all of us and none of us are 
beyond suffering and, and none of us are beyond uh, the capacity for being able to hold such a mass casualty, mass suffering type of event that we're seeing right now. What would you say to those who are on the front lines right now who are suffering? Uh, how would you encourage them to proceed uh, knowing how difficult this can be? Well, first of all, I want to I want to say something about that that was really illustrated by by Dr. Breen's death. What happens, you know, because everybody was surprised, right? And he didn't necessarily We're always surprised when these things That's happen, right? Exactly. We're always surprised. Exactly, because people suffer in silence, and that is one of the most important things that we need that people need to hear this touches so many people and most of them suffer in silence which gets back again to why we need to be screening we need to be asking because that's the way we're going to find the people suffering in silence and what i would also say is that being a hero part of being the heroes that you guys are is knowing that taking care of yourself is also as critical to preserving your capacity to continue to be our heroes, right? So preserving those moments, you know, not, not I mean, we know burnout is already a problem and people are doing exactly what, they, what they're asked to do, but the extremes that you hear about, right? People have to not, they think that they're sacrificing and self-sacrifice, you know, for the good of the community. But when you're breaking yourself down like that and not taking care of yourself, that's not going to help anybody. And you're going to be our heroes, you know, by, by also taking care of yourselves. Yeah, there are so many people that want to help. Uh, and, and we hear about the strain on the system and healthcare shortages and worker shortages and people get into a, a flow of, of, of feeling like they can't stop. You know, once you've engaged in this battle, you ran into the fire, you can't run back out. At least that's the perception. How do you address that sensation that people have once they're engaged in the fight, that they just can't slow down, they just can't stop? We have to, everybody has to understand that you can't keep running, right? You, you gotta take your water breaks. You got to take your mental health breaks or you will not be able to be the hero we need you guys to be, right? If you're not taking care of yourself. Just like the cliche, put the oxygen mask on yourself and, and then help others. Um, yep. Yep. So Kelly, you're going to be on CNN tonight. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and so people can tune in and watch? Yeah. So um, on Chris Cuomo, um, primetime, and he's been a uh, a great advocate and um, voice for the crisis of mental health, but also also what what we can do about it, you know. And um, so we'll be talking about, you know, all the things that we've talked about and the and the Columbia Protocol, you know. So, for example, you know, I keep stressing how identifying people who are suffering in silence is the first important step the first critical step and, and to get them to the simple, you know, to the treatments that they need. So the night Anthony Bourdain died, you know, um, uh, Chris Cuomo spent the last three minutes of his primetime show saying, you know, stop what you're doing, right? You know, it will save a life. You know what I didn't tell you, you know how I was saying about the, the public health need? Do you know that the Marines and the Air Force, they were the first ones to test, they put it in everybody's hands, every airman, clergy, legal assistants, and it, it helped them reduce suicide significantly. So we know that going and finding people and being there for your peers and your loved ones will actually save lives. Kelly, tell us about the uh, Medal of Honor that you, that you wear so proudly and, and how that came to be. Yeah, so I am um, really you know, it's hard is to that it on your chest right now? Are you wearing it? <laughs> it is. It's hard to describe how, you know, proud I am. I, I, I received the Secretary of Defense Medal for Exceptional Public Service because of this work 
saving lives. So the Department of Defense were the first ones to model for the world that we have to go find people and ask everybody and find them where they, where they work, live, and thrive. So they've been a great model for every state, every country, and every, every community. And I've been very, um, very grateful for my partnership with them. Yeah, so for those who feel that they're too tough or, or you know, asking for help is a sign of weakness, our military is using this protocol. Is that right? Yes, it's, it's all 50 states, every country, every agency, you know, they all use it. Do you know, guess what? There are states where it's policy for the janitor, right? You know, there was a story. So the public health approach can be within the walls of the hospital too. I gave a talk in, in Georgia, I'm, I'm sorry, in Connecticut, and this huge system said, you know, we trained, we gave it to the custodians. And this clinician said, exactly right. I'll never forget that case where the only person that veteran spoke to was, was the janitor. And it doesn't mean he'll ever need to ask these questions, but, but yes. So when I say policy across 50 states, it's in the jail, homeless, school, school teachers. You know, I, got the, I had the honor to give the lead presentation to the Senate after Parkland. And, you know, we talked about, okay, you all have policy for the doctor and often the policeman, but how do we get it in every teacher's hands, every coach's hands before they ever, if they ever get, get to a doctor? So that's one of the great things about this. It's the first time that a simple set of questions can be put in every, everybody's hands. And that's how you save lives because many people don't ever show up to that, that door of the, of the doctor's office. And let's talk about the person standing on the bridge, the person at the brink. And you have a great story that I think will help those who are feeling down right now to hopefully understand the significance of this and open the door for them reaching out. And it's, it's a young man standing on the Golden Gate Bridge. Can you take us through that, Kelly? Yes, I'm so glad. I thought a few minutes ago that I wanted to tell that story. So thank you. Thank you for reminding me. So my, my good friend and partner, Kevin Hines, survived jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, which by the way, is not, not fatal 99% of the time. And he tells a story, um, and he's only one of five people walking because another miracle happened with an orthopedic surgeon who happened to be there. He tells a story about wake, waking up that morning, 19 years old, if just one person asks me if I'm okay, I won't do it. He goes on the bus to the Golden Gate Bridge, 100 people crying, what's wrong with that kid? Bus driver shoes him off the bus. He get, goes to the side of the bridge with policemen, you know, riding their bikes by who are supposed to spot jumpers. And finally, he sees a woman walking towards him and he becomes hopeful. And she says, can you take my picture? Um, five times she asked him to take her picture. And he said, screw this, nobody cares. And he jumped. And he said, as he jumped, he realized that all of the problems in his life were fixable, except the fact that he just jumped. And he talks about this brain illness. And I would say people want to be asked and they need to be asked. And I have to tell you, he gets down in the water and realizes he's alive and feels something slimy. And he says, oh my God, I just survived jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and now I'm going to get eaten by a shark. Just my luck. So he was on a TV show months later and this guy says, Kevin, I was standing next to you. I'm so happy you were alive, but let me tell you, buddy, it was a sea lion, not a shark, who kept him afloat you know, till he was rescued. Meant to be. It's amazing. It's an amazing story. And my daughter, Emma, uh, was, was uh, watching How Animals Help People. There's a show, I think, on Animal Planet that uh, talks about the ways in which animals help people. And that's, she was very familiar with this story because the sea lion ended up saving his life. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing stuff. So Kelly, you are uh, an awesome human being and, and I love the work that you're doing and I really hope that a lot of people get to see this and it inspires others to recognize the fact that if one person asks, you can be the difference maker here. And for people who are feeling helpless, there's no greater way to turn that around than to provide service to someone else and, and to be a beacon of light for someone else. So look for the Columbia Protocol, look for Kelly tonight on CNN and Spread the word. This is, this is a preventable illness. This is a disease. And uh, nobody wants to feel this way. If, uh, if you're down, ask for help. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon, Kelly. 
Thank you for your commitment and your passion. It, it, I have no doubt it also saves a lot of lives. So.